words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Let's be seated. We often hear it said that uh, Christians and the church are always going on about sex. Uh, so it's uh, a bit of a surprise that it takes the Church of England to the 11th homily uh, before they start uh, dealing with this issue, uh, proof perhaps that we don't uh, always go on about sex. In this uh, discipleship uh, service series, we're looking at the homilies of the Church of England and reworking the teaching of them um, in a more contemporary style. But I think the start of this homily is probably worth uh, quoting uh, a little bit more fully. Uh, and this is taken from Lee Gates's uh, modern version of uh, the homilies. It says this. There is no lack, good Christian people, of great swarms of vices which are worthy to be rebuked. Into such decay has true godliness and virtuous living now come. Yet above other vices, the outrageous sea of adultery, promiscuity, fornication and uncleanness has not only burst in, but also overflowed almost the whole world. This vice is so abundantly common and has grown to such a height that among many it is counted no sin at all, but rather a pastime, a dalliance and but a touch of youth, not rebuked, but winked at, not punished, but laughed at. Therefore, it is necessary at this present time to implore you about the state, uh, about the sin of promiscuity and fornication, declaring to you the greatness of this sin and how odious, hateful and abominable it is and has always been considered by God and all good people. For those uh, words written in Tudor times, have a very familiar ring to them. Perhaps not much has changed uh, since they were written, uh, although perhaps it has got even worse uh, than that. We need a sexual revolution, uh, and that's part of the point of that homily then, uh, and is, is needed to be heard again in our own time. We need a sexual revolution, a Christian sexual revolution, that same revolution that Jesus' teaching brought uh, 2,000 years ago, that his teaching brought to a Greco-Roman society that saw nothing wrong with powerful men using anyone for their own sexual gratification. We need a Christian sexual revolution again. And the seeds of that revolution were sown with that commandment uh, that God gave to Moses, you shall not commit adultery. As one of the Ten Commandments, it shows how seriously God takes this subject. And uh, by extension, this commandment not to commit adultery extends uh, to all sexual activity outside of marriage. And perhaps these days we need to clarify that by marriage we mean the marriage of a male with a female uh, and perhaps further clarification is needed it's a biological male with a biological female but to understand why sexual activity outside of marriage is so great a sin we need to see and understand why sex belongs in marriage and uh, we need to answer three questions where does marriage come from what is it for and what does it mean? And the answers to these questions we get from our marriage services, but also in the second book of homilies, homily number 18, there is a homily on uh, marriage itself. So that first question, where does marriage come from? Well, uh, the marriage service tells us that marriage is instituted by God. It's something that God has given us as a gift to creation. And we see that reflected in Jesus' teaching uh, in our second reading from Mark's Gospel. Jesus reminds us 
at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female, and for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Marriage is instituted by God. It's something he's created. He's something he's created in the way he has made us as humans, but it's also something that we can't mess around with. We can't decide what marriage is about because God has already decided what marriage is about and has told us so. It is a man leaving his father and mother and being united with his wife. So that's where marriage comes from. What about what it's for? Well, the marriage services give us the three traditional purposes of marriage. The first one is for friendship and mutual society. The second is for the procreation of children. And the third reason for marriage is that the natural instincts and affections implanted by God should be hallowed and directed aright. That's uh, a very uh, verbose way of saying that sex belongs in marriage. Because those instincts that we have, those sexual desires that we have, have been implanted by God. They've been given to us in the way he has made us as human beings. But they're not just to be used however we want. They are instead uh, hallowed and directed aright by marriage. They, the only holy place, hallowed place for sex is within marriage. And the only way that we direct those instincts uh, correctly is within marriage. And that's uh, one of the three purposes that marriage is a place where those sexual desires can be made holy and directed in the right way. So that's what marriage is for. But thirdly, what does marriage mean? Well, our marriage services draw on Paul's letter to the Ephesians and tell us that marriage is about Christ and the church. It signifies that mystical union of Christ and the church. The reason God has made us uh, to desire marriage is because the marriage is there uh, to point us towards that union that he wants with us. That great image at the end of Revelation, uh, that great image of what eternal life is like, is the marriage of Jesus with the church. And within that image, we understand some things about marriage. We see that Jesus and the church are different, and just as marriage is between the difference of male and female. It's that difference that makes the complementarity that mirrors Jesus and the church. And also we get that idea of an exclusive commitment. Jesus has given himself for the church and the church gives itself to Jesus. There is that exclusive commitment that is, ma that is uh, mirrored in the marriage vows. So we've seen that marriage is instituted by God. We see that one of the purposes of marriage is uh, for the making holy and directing a right of our sexual instincts. And we've seen that all of it sig uh, signifies that mystical union of Jesus and the church. And because it, signif it signifies Jesus and the church, because it is such a great thing, the devil will try to attack and break down not only marriage as an institution, but also individual marriages, which is why married couples need to be praying and asking the Holy Spirit to help them, uh, to help keep their marriages strong. But it's, the devil will also try to misdirect our instincts and affections, to direct them away from what is holy, the holy use of them in marriage, and instead uh, direct them uh, for uh, evil purposes, for purposes that go against uh, that use, uh, of that, that purpose of sex in marriage. 
So, for all those three reasons, because of where marriage comes from, because of what it is for, and because of what it signifies, we can say that sexual activity belongs within a male-female marriage. And therefore, sexual activity outside of marriage is a rejection of God's intention, and it's a distortion of that image of Jesus and the Church. No wonder the Bible warns us against sexual sin. And we see that warning coming through Jesus' own teaching. He talks uh, about that commandment, you shall not commit adultery, but then expands it and says, uh, this isn't just adultery as we might understand it, uh, as in uh, having an affair uh, with someone who is married or being married and having an affair with someone who isn't your spouse. Jesus expands the definition of adultery uh, to include looking lustfully at other people. He widens it from that interpretation that limits it uh, to married people and makes it a universal commandment. A commandment that applies not just to those who are married, but to everyone. And so Jesus commands us to keep our bodies and our minds pure. To the woman who is caught in adultery, he says to her, go and sin no more. Sexual activity outside of marriage, Jesus is clear, is a sin, needs to be repented of and needs uh, to be stopped. So if Jesus commands uh, uh, us against sexual activity outside of a male-female marriage, then we should be, be obedient to his teaching. And as a church, we should be teaching the same if we want to say that we follow him as our master. But it's not just Jesus in the New Testament uh, that warns us against this sexual immorality. John the Baptist faced imprisonment and execution for rebuking Herod's sexual sin, which will be uh, a foolish thing to do if uh, sex is just a pastime, a dalliance, or a thing of little importance. The apostles in Acts, when they're writing and giving instructions to the Christians in Antioch, uh, give them very few instructions, but one of them is to avoid fornication. And Paul, in his letters, frequently uh, warns the churches he's writing to to flee from sexual immorality, calling it a deed of darkness, a deed of darkness, and as we heard in our first reading, a sin against our own bodies, which is not just bad because it's a sin against our own bodies but also in view of what it means to be a Christian. It is doubly bad because, as Paul reminds us, our bodies are not our own. We have been bought with a price. We have been bought with the price of Jesus' blood and we are united with him. So what we do with our bodies is really important. So he tells the Corinthians we should glorify God with our bodies. And also in that passage he talks about the body being the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells within our bodies. So again, it's really important what we do with our bodies and uh, so it doesn't uh, corrupt that Holy Spirit within us. Sexual immorality corrupts both our body and our soul. It makes the temple of the Holy Spirit into a dungeon of unclean spirits and it makes the mansion of God into the dwelling place of Satan. No wonder sexual immorality prevents us from entering the kingdom of heaven, as Paul again tells the Corinthians. But the seriousness of sexual sin can also be seen from the punishments that it receives in the Bible throughout it. Uh, we see that sexual immorality is one of the causes of the flood uh, that Noah was saved through. We also see, uh, probably most famously, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed because of sexual immorality. And the Old Testament law given to Moses 
the punishment for adultery was death, as we see in the example in the New Testament where the woman is going to be stoned to death uh, before Jesus tells her to go and sin no more. But it's not just uh, those punishments uh, that uh, sexual immorality receives in the Bible that show us how serious it is. Just by looking at the causes, the, the effects and the damage that sexual immorality causes, uh, we can see how serious it is. We talk a lot uh, these days uh, to young people in their uh, sexual education about sexually transmitted diseases. But one thing that's often missed out of that teaching is that sexual immorality is the biggest spreader of sexually transmitted diseases. If you're promiscuous, uh, sexual, sexually transmitted diseases are transmitted much further and faster. If uh, you only uh, have sex with one person in the whole of your life, uh, sexually transmitted diseases uh, will shrink rapidly uh, in cases. So uh, that's one of the damages that sexual immorality causes. Another uh, is, uh, is that sexual immorality causes many children to grow up without both their biological parents being together. And there have been many studies about the effect that that has on children's well-being. One of the reasons why God has instituted marriage is for the procreation of children, but also so that they may be brought up uh, within uh, a stable uh, unit. Those, the father and the mother, uh, being committed to each other in love. And so that provides a stable uh, environment for children to grow up in. Uh, of course, uh, adultery is one of the causes of uh, divorce uh, and many of them are, are the result of adultery uh, and sexual immorality. But perhaps most serious of all, many abortions result from sexual activity outside of that covenanted commitment of marriage. So we've heard of the greatness uh, of the sin of sexual immorality and how the devil will try to use it uh, to damage us or our fellow human beings or to damage our image of God and our relationship with him. So whether we are single or married, we should uh, strive to avoid sexual sin. We should strive to keep our hearts pure and clean. Ways we can do that is through prayer and Bible study through fellowship within the church but most of all we need the Holy Spirit within us guarding and cleansing our hearts and minds. As I said at the beginning it's often said that the church is constantly going on about sex but perhaps looking at the world around us we haven't been going on about it enough. Perhaps well, we've not told that beautiful story of how God wants an intimate relationship with each of us and how he's given us marriage and in particular sexual activity within marriage as a sign of that union that he wants with us, as a way of helping us to understand that union he wants with us and to experience a glimpse of what that union is like. And of course that union is available to any of us whether we are single or married. That is God's ultimate aim for us, not to be uh, sexually active people, but to be people who are united with him. And that is the beautiful story that God has given to us with the gift of marriage and sexual activity within marriage. That's the beautiful story that we need to tell the world again about because that will bring the sexual revolution that Jesus brings. And we are not just to teach it, but to live it out in our own lives too.